she had met this wonderful gentleman and she felt that um, she was from the old school and she felt that she could not um, enjoy her life in the way that um, that she desired because she had not um, entered you know legally into this relationship with this man and if she were to marry him she would have to give up uh, give up her husband's pension. Uh, she was married to her husband for almost 50 years. That played on my heartstrings. But I also feel like, and just in terms of two men and two women, if that's what you choose to do, and you legally want to go into a contract, that's your business. Now, what I wouldn't support, and what I don't believe I would ever do, is to tell the church community that you have to honor this relationship. No church has to honor the relationship that a couple enters into legally. Okay, now just to play devil's advocate though, everybody's worried about, oh, if you start smoking marijuana, then you're gonna be strung out on the street, homeless smoking crack and stuff like that. But what about, uh, you, you talk about access and stuff like that to it. What about things like tobacco? What about things like alcohol that some people are deeming far worse than marijuana? And then mm -hmm. you got people that, well, if I can't have marijuana, I'll just use codeine, but now I end up taking code 10, 10 20 a day. Because mm -hmm. there's people out there doing 20 Vicodin a day. Well, what, 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 how do you feel about that versus what people are deeming marijuana as just a not harmless drug? Of course, we know not that, but um, just, just how, how do you compare the two? And how do you <clears> say no to me, one and yes to the other? Here, here's the issue. Um, the basis of why Vicodin exists. People, you can abuse anything. You know, if, if you really want to, you can go in that bathroom and you can huff that air freshener if you want to. And, you you know, you want to feel a buzz or a high, you can huff some air freshener. So the reality is if people want to find a way um, to abuse a substance, they will. Um, people are sniffing bath salts now to get high. So it's not as if we have the ability to um, control everything. And... Um, to put, um, to wrap government's hands around everything per se. But if we do have an ability to keep some sort of uh, control on a substance that can potentially be abused, then you have to try and do that. Because if you don't, then just open the floodgates and let everybody do everything they want to do. And, uh, you know, then just let, let allow the police to deal with, you know, allow them to deal with the fallout. Um, I think that Oftentimes you do have people that abuse uh, codeine, syrup, and all kinds of you know, and all kinds of other uh, illicit drugs. Some illegal, some legal. But I do think that the fact that we do have some sense of regulation on, I think that just in terms of law enforcement, um, in terms of making uh, parents feel safe, that we have to, as a as a state, people who are uh, vowed by the Constitution to hold up the Constitution, if we're going to take an illegal substance and make, you know, aspects of it legal, we have to be sure to, we have to make the general public feel as though we're doing the right thing for the right reason. And it can't just be about money. Well, what do you make uh, of all the violence? L last year we had, you know, the highest amount of homicides we had since 89. We've had two homicides so far this year. What do you make of all this violence in your district? You know what, I feel, I feel like not enough young people dream. And when I say that, that enough young people don't dream, it, and I don't mean dream about being becoming Lil Wayne or Jay-Z or dream of becoming Beyonce. And that's fine too. But when I say dreaming, dreaming about how can I change my situation? What are some of the things that I can do to make this situation better for my mom, better for me, my sister, my brother? How can I change this? I can go to, I can go to college. But in order for me to get to college, I gotta finish grade school. I have to finish high school. Um, I can get a career. I can become a police officer, a firefighter, a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, a garbage man. You don't have enough young people that are dreaming about one day seeing themselves successfully in the future. I truly believe that they want to be successful, but they don't see themselves 
as being successful in the future. Because when people feel like you have something to lose, when I think about myself, when I think about some of the things that I did as a teenager, and when I think about life the way that I think now, I did some things I wasn't supposed to do. I you know, wouldn't completely go so far as saying I was reckless, but you have to be able to see yourself positively in the future. And if you don't, what what governs you? And do you think hip-hop has you... something to do with uh, some of this violence? Because some of the older generations say, well, it's all the hip-hop music, and if we get rid of that, we can, we can heal up a lot of this stuff. You know, may, may, you know maybe it's my generation, so I don't want to, you know, use that as the easy target. I feel like what we have in hip-hop, um, it's a reflection of what we're seeing in our community. So then we get into this whole conversation of what came first, the chicken or the egg? Was it the community that made the artists talk about the things that they talk about? Or, you know, was it the, was it the exact opposite? Do I think that hip-hop plays a part? Certainly. Yeah, I mean, when people, when many of the young folks that are out there committing some of the violence, they aren't listening to gospel music, mm. you know, on a regular basis. I mean, but at the same time, I'm not going to just solely blame um, hip hop music for all the for all the ills of society either. I feel that we have to take hip hop, and before we say, "Oh, throw it in the garbage," you know what? Sit down, and if you can stomach it. Listen to it. And you know what? When you Good listen to it, you know what? No. Take the stuff that young people are listening to. And if you think that as an adult, they aren't telling the truth. If you hear a rapper who's been rapping for five years, seven years, ten years, rapping about selling drugs, poke holes in, poke holes in what he's saying. You know, if you're a parent, if you're an adult, and you hear this stuff, Tell your son or your daughter. Like that's, teach them from the verse. That's level. it. Who's because your favorite rapper? Jay-Z. Okay. Why? He paints pictures with words. Okay. And, and real quick, while we're talking about violence and stuff like that. And real quick, let me just add something real quick to that, to the hip-hop piece. Hip-hop is about being real. It's about telling your story. And if you can show a young person that that story isn't real, that what he's rapping about, he's lying about, what it does is probably in your presence, they're not going to probably go with you, but when they're talking to their friends, they may begin to have a different sort of conversation about what this rapper is rapping about. So sometimes you just have to plant seeds with young people, even if you think they aren't listening, they are. So my suggestion would be for people to, because rap's not going, hip hop's not going anywhere. So all you can do is try to take the hip hop that's out there. If you think it's terrible, poke holes in it. Tell them where they're not being honest. They're not. They're not being real. And then if you hear something that isn't so terrible, you know, hopefully, um, tell them why that's so good, and tell them why that is more in line with reality and more in line with the life that they're probably leading. You uh, you briefly mentioned your uh, teenage life and just uh, not exactly just being the same person that you are. Uh, I googled your name not too long ago just uh, you know in, in prep for this interview and I couldn't google your name without it coming up Jahan Gordon shoplifting mm -hmm. and that was one of the hurdles that you had to overcome uh, when you were trying to get elected the first time. How, how did you rise above that? Hard work. You know the reality of it was <clears throat> that when you when you decide to run for office anything that you've ever done in your life is going to be out there on the table for the world to see. And for me, what I did when my opponent decided to use um, one of my teenage indiscretions against me in a political campaign 10 years later, what I did was I continued to work. You know, I continued to talk to people as I had been before, and I allowed them to see the woman that I am today. Do you feel like that type of stuff in the campaign is off limits? No, I don't. I feel like that was something that they wanted to use. I feel like they wanted to try to, <clears throat> they wanted to try to paint me as though that was the woman that I am today. And that isn't, it's far from the truth. And the reality of it is, um, as I got out into the community and I began to talk about, talk to people, many people told me that's exactly why um, 
they would never run for office because they did this in their life or their husband did that. And if they ever decided to run for office, all of that stuff would be out there for the world to see. And I told them that I would often say, but if your desire to serve is bigger than the hurt that you would feel from some public humiliation, because that is what it is, mm -hmm. is public humiliation. But if your desire to serve is stronger than that, then you have to do it. Um, but if you're, uh, if you want to preserve your feelings and you want to, uh, if you feel like you're a little tender, then I'd probably suggest that politics is not the arena for you. But I, I, I personally feel that in my life, me having the opportunity to do this is bigger than me. Um, I feel like because this was not something that I dreamed about, it wasn't something that was a goal of mine. I feel like God put me in this position to be able to do this um, and allow me to be an example for many young people that have made a mistake, um, that might be about ready to make a mistake. But when I think about my life, and I'm 29 years old, when I think about my life growing up here in this community 15 years ago as a 14-year-old young woman going into Limestone High School as a freshman, I didn't see people that looked like me that were um, engaged and involved and in moving positively and you know, moving in a way that truly had the ability to sit at the table with people that don't look anything like me. So when I think about the fact that I always wanted as a young woman to see someone that looked like me, um, what it makes me do is it makes me hold my head a little bit higher. It makes me have my back a little straighter because I know that there is some young boy, some young girl that's looking up to me. And um, I did make a mistake when I was um, a teenager, but I was a teenager, and the fact of the matter of it is I'm an adult now, and I have to carry myself accordingly. And well, let, luckily you were forgiven for that, and, uh, you know, and, Amer and people name America as being one of those you know, forgiving type countries, but some things aren't forgiven, and one of those things uh, is when you get sentenced to death. You know? And as you know, uh, a couple weeks from now, uh, Governor Pat Quinn has to decide whether or not he wants to abolish the death penalty or keep it going, and you voted to keep it going. Why is that? Do you remember uh, Larry Bright? Mm, name rings a bell, okay. no. Larry Bright was uh, a serial killer that killed um, black women in this community. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. In this, yeah. In this community mm. um, less than 10 years ago. Mm. And Larry Bright lived uh, around the corner from my parents. And Larry Bright, many, <clears throat> many of the families that were able to receive closure, and when I say closure, I don't mean they found their loved one alive, but Larry Bright eventually ended up telling the prosecutors where their bodies were. That's what I'm calling closure. The only reason why Larry Bright told prosecutors where those other bodies were buried was because they took the death penalty off the table. So there were families in this community that without the death penalty being removed, without the death penalty uh, being a tool, they never would have known what happened to their family member. And um, it was not a decision that I made lightly. It was something that I prayed about, it was something that I studied, that I read about, and I felt that because of me knowing what that um, serial killer did to this community, what it did for the families, two of the women that he killed I knew personally. One of them I grew up with. The other one that I knew was uh, my friend's mother. So me knowing personally what happened to those families and the importance of them knowing what happened to their loved one and to know the only reason why they were able to have that closure was because a death penalty was a tool. Um, to me, that's important. What? It's important for um, families to have closure. With that being said, um, and I've been on record as saying this, I do support a moratorium on the death penalty. Um, when we think about the amount of people that have been exonerated in the state of Illinois in the last 20 years, I feel as though it's um, one is too many. So for that fact, I don't support moving forward with executing 
men and women, until we can get to a place as a country, and I don't know how we get to that place, until we get to a place where unequivocally, without a shadow of a doubt, we know that this person who is being sentenced to death um, actually committed that crime. So without us having that ability, I do support a moratorium. But I also want to give our prosecutors who are um, charged with you know, solving, solving murders. I have, a, uh, I have a cousin who was murdered on broad daylight um, on the East Bluff less than a year and a half ago. And our family has not had any closure whatsoever to that murder. So I know what it means for a family to have closure. Uh, you make 67000 a year, a little over 67000 a year. How do you uh, translate a message of hope to your constituents who have no job or are sitting on their 99 weeks and they got four days left and they're looking at Jahan Gordon who's you know, twice as young as them and she's making well over 60000 a year? One of the things that I did, um, and I was proactive on this issue long before an election cycle, is I took um, over a 10% pay cut. Um, just as a means to, um, is it going to fix the budget? No, let me be clear on that. Um, but just as a signal to my constituents that I know that, you know, you all are dealing with issues and um, I want to show you that I'm trying Sharing to do this. Type. Certainly, yeah. I'm trying to do this for the right reason. And knowing the, um, the incredibly difficult budget that we're walking into, um, I want to cut my salary again, another 10%. And I know that you probably have some people out on TV land like, what? Is she crazy? <laughs> but I don't do this because I'm looking to, you know, cash a check. Trust me, I could do some other things and I could make more money than I make mm -hmm. doing this. But I feel that God has put me in this place at this time. When I when I thought, okay, maybe I can make a difference in Springfield, when I first decided to run for office, I felt like um, I want to help build people up. I want to help build um, communities, help build this community. Um, that's not what we're really having the ability to do right now. I feel like we're putting out fires. Um, I feel like God put me in this place at this time to help get things stable. And then it's time for me to move along and go do something else. And maybe the person who comes behind me, maybe that young person or that not so young person, will have the ability to do some of the things that I wanted to do. Maybe they will have the ability to build, but that's not really where we are right now. So um, when thinking about why I do this and um, the sacrifice that I'm, um, that I'm making willfully, uh, the, the next 10%, so essentially um, I willfully cut my pay by over 20% is what I did, is what I'm doing. Um, it's a piece of legislation that uh, actually passed out of um, state government committee on Wednesday. And I've co-sponsored that legislation. That legislation will probably come to the floor next week or the following week. And uh, we'll take a vote uh, regardless of what the, um, the outcome on the vote is. You know, my pay will be, I'm, you know, foregoing another 10%. Uh, which will be over 20% of my pay, um, just to show my constituents that I'm serious about this, um, the pain that you know, many families are going to be experiencing and struggling. Um, I want to share in that with them. You know, I, don't want this to, um, I don't want this to be a situation where folks feel like, um, oh, she's sitting up here and she's making these, these decisions that are affecting us, but she's not feeling any of it. Um, trust me, I don't care who you are. Uh, if you're a middle class person and you cut your and your pay is cut 20 percent, you're gonna feel it. You're in your second term now. Uh, in your during your first time, unfortunately, your mother passed away. Uh, she did get to see you uh, get elected, but uh, she passed before you got reelected. How, how, how does that? How, how did that impact your job? And uh, how do you feel about everything uh, in retrospect that she didn't get to see you reelected? That that the people of Peoria wanted you back. It hurts. Um, it hurts probably more than anything else. Um, I started this with her. Um,
she and I decided to do this at uh, her kitchen table. And uh, we called a couple of her friends and none of us knew what we were doing. And we decided we were gonna do it. And um, she saw that first campaign, she saw it, she watched that campaign rip me to shreds. And um, she saw me overcome that. And my mom told me that I was stronger than she ever thought I was. And she saw me go through another campaign. And she saw me um, have the ability to be successful in that as well. Um, but oftentimes, uh, we don't know uh, what's going to happen to us. We don't know what's going to happen to our loved ones. And um, the next, for me, it's, it, it's this next phase of my life, um, having the ability to be reelected, um, seeing the kind of, the kind of outpouring um, that people have for me over the, all over this community. Uh, my first two camp, my first two elections, they weren't landslide victories. I just kind of, I kind of eked it out the first time. I won by um, maybe 200 votes, you know, by less than one percentage point. Second election, won maybe by two percentage points. This last one, I think I won by maybe. 14, 15 points, and uh, my mom was instrumental in the runnings of this office. So her, her not being there to to you know to see us go from where we started and all the mistakes that we made, and to see where we had become an operation, uh, it pains me. It hurts me that my mom's not going to ever see me. Um, have a child. It hurts me that my mother will never see me. Um, she won't see me get married. Um, my mother was not, she was my best friend. So um, her not being here, her presence not being here, um, it wasn't just the mother-daughter. It wasn't just mother and daughter that happened to be best friends. Uh, if my mother was alive, she'd be here today, bar none. Mm -hmm. She would have been here. Chances are, um, when you called her, you might would have talked. You might would have spoken with her on the telephone as opposed to um, talking to Cami because she was my mother was involved in every aspect of my life. So um, I feel her. I feel her presence and I feel her absence in every way um, that I could possibly feel it. So it's it's made it's made me. It's made me understand that no matter what, you have to, we must persevere. I never in life would have imagined losing my mom the way I lost her. Um, I didn't lose her to violence or anything, but she had a massive heart attack. She was fine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, next thing you know, she was gone. I assumed, like, you know, a lot of other folks, my mom was going to live till she was about 99 or 100, and I was going to watch her slowly deteriorate and... That didn't happen. Make you like look at life a little differently? Oh. It showed me um, what's important, that um, I absolutely allowed um, my, my career and this job to um, take over every aspect of my life. I did not have time for anything other than things associated with this job. This job is still incredibly important to me, and it always will be. But I know that family and friends are the things that matter most. And you can't push those things off to the side. You have to make the time. Um, just as uh, dealing with the state budget, um, as much as you don't want to say no sometimes, sometimes you have to say no. I'm learning that um, we're not promised tomorrow. So... Sometimes when things come about and there may be an event that I really want to go to, sometimes I say no now because my fam I know that my family could be, can be taken away from me at, at any point in time. And at the end of the day, that's what's important. Um, I want to be able to live a, leave a legacy in this community. 
I want to be able to live a legacy through the things that I'm able to do in this office. But more importantly, I want to be able to leave a legacy in this community because of the kind of family um, that I have and want to have in the future in terms of having children. So that's a lot of work as well. I want to be able to do, to do those things. So for me, um, losing my mother the way that I did um, has really shown me there's there's something to be said for balance and the necessity of balance. Because, I'll give you an example. Thanksgiving, my mother wanted to, um, for some reason, uh, my mother had this urgency about her the last couple of months. I didn't know what it was. Um, she wanted the entire family to get together for Thanksgiving up in Chicago at my brother's house. And, you know, she's just getting my brothers and sisters together. I'm the youngest of eight. Just getting all my brothers and sisters together and saying, we're going to Chicago and, you know, you need to be there. And I went to my mom's house one night and I said, Mom, I can't go to Chicago, you know, for Christmas. I have to, I have to work the next day. I have to go to the Christmas parade the day after Thanksgiving, so I can't go to Chicago. And we talked a little bit and I was leaving her house and I was going back home and I looked back up the stairs and I saw the look on her face. And uh, she just looked so sad that I went back up the stairs and I said, Mom, don't look like that. You know, we're going to have other, we're going to have other times that we can be, that, you know, we're going to have other Thanksgivings. And uh, she said, John, I just wanted to get the family together. I just wanted us to be together. And I said, Mom, this is, we'll be together on Christmas. Mm. Well, she died December 20th. So we weren't. And um, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that. And I don't feel like, um, I don't feel a lot of regrets in terms of my relationship with my mother because my mother and I had a wonderful relationship. She loved me, I loved her, and we showed each other. But what would you say to anybody that wants your position? Any, any young person, 15, 16, 17, I want to be John Gordon. Oh, I would, I would be honored that they would um, decide to choose a life in public service. Um, and if, I, if me doing this played any, played any part in helping to shape that decision, um, you know, it, it, it made me, I, knowing that would make me feel good going to my grave. But continue to stay involved in your community, stay active in your community, um, learn this community. We need young people at a young age. That wasn't necessarily me looking at, you know, I want to be an elected official, but I was involved. I was engaged. I had a mother who was a community activist, so she would take me everywhere with her. And she, you know, as a young, as a young, very young kid, she made, she made me to volunteer to the place where I got to a point in my life where I wanted to volunteer. It became a, you know, a very natural thing for me. So just thinking about what it takes to do this job um, without thinking uh, too much about the political side of it, because that's a whole other animal, thinking more about the, the policy aspects of what it takes to really be a, a true advocate for your community. It's learning the voice of your community, learning the needs of your community. Um, as a public servant, we, you know, our job is to serve. So in order to really serve your community, um, you need your community to place an order. You know, you need to know what your community wants, what they need, so you can serve them.